Tola rose up to save Israel, Judges chapter 10. So the Tola or Tola Shani was this little grub right here that you can see. It was actually, a, they call it the scarlet worm or the crimson worm even to this day. In fact, the Temple Institute's even using this today to make the priestly garments, the tapestry, the veil of the temple. It was the red dye basically. And that's what they did in ancient Israel. They would collect these off of the trees. So here's the tabernacle, right? This red color on the covering of the tabernacle right here was dyed with the Tola the, or the Tola Shani, that name Tola, right? And then the tapestries as well. And the priests with their red sashes, was they were also dyed with that Tola. So here's a video that you can see <laughs> showing it. And I wrote this book, by the way, this Tola Shani book that you can find on Amazon if you wish, The Crimson Worm of Psalm 22. And it tells an amazing story. If In fact, it tells a story of the gospel. But you can see in this video, it's a little bit glitchy here, but you can see that these little grubs, they would collect them off the trees. Ancient Israel did this, okay? And then they would scrape them off the trees and they would dry them out in the sun. And then they would crush them, similar to what I'm doing right here. You would actually crush these down into a fine powder. And that fine powder was this crimson red powder. And when you add the boiling water to it, like they did in ancient Israel, you would get this crimson red dye that was used on the veil of the temple or the curtain that separated the whole holy place from the holy of holies right the priestly garments the red sashes around the priests and also the red the scarlet crimson red yarn that was tied around the scapegoat and so it shows a picture of the the gospel of jesus christ in it if you look so here's a cord that was dyed with that scarlet red right like rahab had that scarlet red cord so it's an amazing thing. So the Judges chapter 10, the Tola, he was the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. <laughs> That's a funny name, right? Dodo. Now, I'm not trying to mock the Bible or anything like that, but it's just it's just a funny name. But this these names actually mean something really amazing, and it shows a picture of Jesus as well. Now, watch this. This is amazing right here. So his grandfather's name, Pua, means splendid. And his father's name, Dodo, means his beloved. Isn't that amazing? So his beloved, remember Jesus was the most loved. He was the, the father's most loved son. Behold, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John said as Jesus was baptized. But then what happened after that? And then they heard the voice of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> and we see in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what Jesus did. It was a rescue mission to rescue you and to rescue me from our sin that, that we were condemned with because sin has to be condemned. All right, let's continue on in this. So those are those, those amazing names that we see a picture of Jesus in. And Judges 10 also says, a man of Issachar. Now, what does Issachar mean? Issachar means we or he will bring a reward. Now, doesn't that remind you of Jesus, right? Colossians 3, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people. Here it is. Knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. So Jesus is going to come back to give those who believe in him a reward. And those who don't believe in him will get condemnation, get punishment. But if you would just simply believe in him and take that free gift from him of salvation by turning from your sinful ways and surrendering your life, to surrendering yourself to Jesus Christ, you will be rewarded. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to be born again of him. All right, so let's continue on here. And Judges 10 continues and says, this Tola rose up to save Israel. Doesn't that remind you of Jesus? He rose up to save Israel. Whoa, Jeremiah 30 says, Jeremiah says, 30 says, Whoa, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress or Jacob's trouble, as you may have heard it. Yet he will be saved from 
it. Now, what is this speaking of right here in Jeremiah 30 and also in 31? It's speaking of God coming back to rescue Israel in the latter days, speaking about the last days before Messiah comes, right? That's what it's speaking of. And it says here, Jacob's trouble, right? There's none like it. And this is about Jacob's trouble. And and yet he will be saved from it. That scripture says, here it is again. And yet he will be saved from it. I love that, don't you? (laughs) And Jeremiah 30 continues in another spot. It says, for I will restore you to health and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast saying, it is Zion. No one cares for her. Doesn't that sound like today? People are saying that, you know, I, I we just can't stand Zionism, they say. They hate that word Zion, Zion or Zionism. In fact, they even Christians, some Christians, progressive Christians, can't stand Zionist Christians, they call them. Those Zionist Christians, they're radical right or whatever they might say about them. Be careful with that. God is into Zion. God's going to protect Zion, which is basically Israel. That's what it means, you guys. So be careful how you say that and what you do with that. So let's continue on here. And you can see that today this is going on in our universities and college campuses, even our Ivy League campuses around our country. It's really a disgusting thing that's going on. By any means, it says here, any means these students think that that uh, uh, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. That means wiping Israel off of the map. That means real genocide. And they say that we are Hamas. A shame on them for that. That's actually a sign of the end times because God saw Hamas all over the face of the world before the flood. And Jesus referenced that time as being like his return, right? Well, Hamas is that word for violence. And that's where Hamas got their name. So shame on them. (laughs) It's not a good thing. So they're also calling today for Netanyahu to be a war criminal, to be arrested, they're thinking about this at the Hague, the you know the court for you know prosecuting court for international stuff. And it, they're just evil. That's evil, and it's against scripture. It's against the Bible, and they don't care. But God is the ultimate judge. God is the real judge, the supreme judge, not these little human judges that are corrupt. So this is them right here. These are the people, right? They the international court. And they want to prosecute and they want to arrest Benjamin Netanyahu and his staff and the Secretary of Defense and all these good guys. Those are the good guys. These are the bad guys. That's the reality, according to how God says it and how we see scripture. So I would be careful if I were you. This is a warning shot to you people because you're messing with God. You don't want to do that. (laughs) So Jeremiah 30 continues, for I will restore you. He's speaking about Israel here in the latter days. I will restore you to health and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast saying it is Zion. No one cares for her. That's kind of like what they're saying today, you guys. Isn't that crazy? So it is Zion. No one cares for her. Really? Really? Uh, God cares. Isaiah 61, Jesus read this scripture from his hometown in Nazareth. Remember that in his first coming, his humble coming, where he came to heal and forgive and and bring people to, to be saved. And it says to proclaim, he ended it with saying this, reading this part of it, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he stopped right there. The favorable year of the Lord, he rolled up the scroll of Isaiah and he said, today, these scriptures have been fulfilled. But what's the rest of it? And the day of vengeance of our God. Whoa, nobody talks about that, do they? It seems seemingly. And it continues to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. That's speaking about his second coming to save Israel. And the entire valley, Jeremiah 31 continues, and the entire valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy to the Lord. It will not be uprooted or overthrown ever again. This is what God said, never again. 
never again. That didn't that wasn't fulfilled before 70 AD or even after 70. That wasn't fulfilled because of 70 AD. So in the future, this was speaking future. This is like what the book of Revelation is talking about, how God's going to save Israel and those who turn to him in that tribulation period or the time of Jacob's trouble, right? It will not be uprooted or overthrown ever again. Don't you love that? I do. <laughs> I love that because I love Israel. Jesus loves Israel. If you hate Israel, then I think your salvation is in question, my friend. Now, a lot of people say, well, God has nothing to do with that nation, Israel. And they think everything was fulfilled right up to where Jesus, you know, died on the cross, ascended back into heaven, and voila, that's it. It's all over. Like, we're living in that thousand-year reign. No, 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 my friend. That's false theology. In fact, the very earliest church did not believe that. They believed that he was coming back to rule and reign from Jerusalem as the prophet Isaiah and Ezekiel spoke of. These are guys like Justin Martyr, uh, guys that were, you know, they were personally uh, discipled by John himself, John the Apostle. So I would believe them before I believe <laughs> the scholars of today, you know, and, and don't get too high on yourself about your education and your scholarship and your uh, theological uh, degrees, because God can use someone with no education and teach them by the Holy Spirit, just like he did with those disciples. And they knew way more. In fact, the Pharisees were like, who are these uneducated men, you know, teaching with such great authority? because the Holy Spirit gave them that, all right? So, hey, by the way, if you want to see more of Jesus in the Old Testament, click on this playlist right here. You want to click on that right now and also hit that subscribe button down below and you won't miss anything. So click on this playlist, my friend.